uh, some funding from the Quebec series. Um, so thanks very much to them for, for doing that. Yay. And uh, before I announce next week's talk, uh, this week's talk, uh, next week we have the final back of the quarter. Uh, it's November 30th. And it will be uh, Kathy Reed from Claremont McKenna College Department of Psychology speaking on the role of specialized body processing for embodied social perception. So that will be a quick talk. And uh, this week, it is my great pleasure to introduce Dave Lou from the Department of Psychology at UC San Diego, who will be talking to us about theory of mind. Thank you. Um, so is the, it sounds like it's working. Uh, so thank you, Clark, and I want to uh, just thank uh, everyone for inviting me, and uh, I've had a great uh, morning so far, and I look forward to also uh, this afternoon and discussing more with everyone about uh, theory of mind as well as other related uh, topics. And um, I'm also excited to also be talking about this group because uh, I'm the, the way I'm presenting the data today is a a new way that I'm thinking about uh, my research, and it seems to have uh, resonance for a lot of people who are interested in cross species work and also uh, in the evolutionary basis of social cognition. So uh, I'm actually interested in getting some feedback from you guys and how uh, all of these things might fit together. So uh, the topic or the title of my talk is the longest title I've ever had for a talk. Um, and basically it sums up everything, so you can leave right now and you'll already get the whole thesis. And the idea is that for a long time, uh, people who have been interested in uh, theory of mind, which is uh, the ability to attribute actions to desires, beliefs, and other mental states as uh, a way to explain and predict uh, other people as, and even our own behaviors. And the question has often led uh, people uh, who come from many different fields who are interested in, in from many different perspectives, but um, partly because probably because the initial paper that uh, used the term theory of mind this way actually asked, what the title of the paper was, uh, do chimpanzees have a theory of mind, right? Um, Pre-Mac and, uh, yeah, Woodruff. Woodruff. Um, and so partly because of that, but also for a number of reasons uh, that I'll uh, preview uh, uh, next, people have been sort of thinking about theory of mind as a single uh, thing, and uh, this has led to people uh, research across the different, uh, across the different, uh, many different topics, such as, uh, the first question that was asked about is, do chimpanzees have a uh, theory of mind? And this has continued to be a hotly debated topic. Uh, do other non-human animals uh, beyond chimpanzees also have uh, theory of mind? And uh, a more recent question that uh, has uh, come up is, do human infants, where some uh, looking time data suggests that perhaps they have some understanding of mental states, and uh, a, a sort of more longer history of developmental research has been asking about whether uh, three-year-olds have theory of mind. And this extends to also other uh, disordered populations, such as to individuals with autism, to individuals with schizophrenia, um, and also uh, related to the way people have been doing brain mapping for theory of mind, it has led to uh, sort of singular questions about do individuals with frontal lobe damage have theory of mind, or do individuals with temporal parietal damage have theory of mind? Um, and I leave it open because uh, the topic is essentially endless. Uh, if anybody, or if any graduate student wants to sort of develop a career, um, a good way of developing it is sort of simply pick something that's not already here, and then just ask, do they have uh, a theory of mind? And, um, and so thinking about theory of mind as a single thing has led to people asking uh, these sorts of questions, but also uh, asking these sorts of questions has led people either implicitly or explicitly 
to think about theory of mind as a singular thing, where uh, debates are uh, often around simply just uh, one camp saying yes and the other camp saying no. Uh, another reason for thinking about theory of mind as a singular thing is the um, classical task, which is the false belief task, which has um, more than any other way of studying theory of mind been uh, used to study children's theory of mind as well as theory of mind in individuals with autism, individuals with schizophrenia, uh, individuals with different brain damages, individuals uh, as well as other uh, um, non-human uh, primates. And just to make sure we're all on the same page, I'll just go through it very quickly, a simple uh, false belief task. So um, an example of a false belief task is a change of location where you might have, tell a child about two different characters. In this case, here's Sally and here's Anne. And Sally has a ball and she puts it into the basket. And then you tell the child, Sally goes uh, away, she's outside and can't see uh, what's going on. And while she can't see, uh, Anne moves the ball into the other uh, box. And uh, you can uh, talk about Anne as in terms of Anne playing a trick or simply Anne uh, sort of accidentally put it in the box. But um, no matter how you do it, it doesn't matter because uh, when the key pieces of information is that uh, Sally was not in the room and so she didn't see the move and so the question for children is do they understand that uh, not seeing the change of location uh, equals not knowing where the new location is. So uh, uh, a child is then asked where will Sally look for the ball when Sally comes back given that she didn't see where it was moved. And the developmental data has been pretty consistent, or has been very consistent, where uh, children who are uh, younger than four consistently answer according to reality. So um, in these cases where there are sort of two choice boxes, one might think that if a, children, if a child doesn't understand what's going on, they might actually choose randomly across the two choices. But um, children, in fact, actually are consistent in choosing the wrong choice which suggests that they actually really think they know what's going on, but in fact, uh, they don't. That is, they answer according to where it really is. So um, one might interpret that as saying that children can't sort of fathom a person could have a false representation of reality. They don't understand that people act on, uh, real on what they think is reality rather than reality itself. Or uh, other interpretations might be that since children themselves know where the ball really is, they can't fathom that someone else ha would have a different perspective on it. Um, and then from four to five, children then become consistently correct where they uh, answer according to what adults would answer, which is that Sally will look in the basket because that's where uh, she had left it. And um, this task has been studied um, probably approaching a thousand or so more times. And uh, without fail, they uh, show a developmental trend between, or not necessarily in the same age range, but a developmental trend in the preschool age. Uh, no matter how you uh, adjust it, you can even sort of simply ask, um, rather than asking where Sally will look for the ball, simply ask, uh, what does Sally think? Where does Sally think the ball is? And they'll also make the same type of error. Uh, so, this has been used uh, overwhelmingly as a task to study theory of mind, and so um, also because of it, it has led to people thinking about theory of mind as simply being understanding false belief. Um, but I would uh, want to argue in uh, today's talk that um, looking at theory of mind this way has, um, while it has been extremely fruitful uh, for the last two decades, it has led to um, a lot of uh, useful research that has uh, given us insights into autism and development, um, asking in this way uh, still uh, sort of obscure certain facts about uh, theory of mind and its development, as well as um, the usefulness of looking at more than just the false belief task. And one of the ways in which um, this is obvious is that um, 
a sort of simple uh, belief desire of psychology, uh, one immediately recognizes that it involves more than simply a uh, representation of uh, belief, but rather it sort of couples with desire, and one also has to understand the types of uh, perception that could lead into the belief, and also the type of basic emotions or physiology that would be related to desire. So, uh, for example, understanding certain preferences leads to certain desires, uh, and together with intentions, it leads to certain actions and then understanding the reactions from it. So uh, one has to understand that, or a simple belief desire for psychology leads us to understand that if someone believes something to be the case and they find out it, it should not be, they will be surprised. Um, and if someone desires a certain thing and it turns out they don't get it, they would be uh, sad, whereas if they do get it, they would be happy. So. Uh, these are simple uh, heuristics or rules or uh, understandings that we have which allows us to do a whole host of things in uh, our social interactions. And so um, a way of thinking about this is whether or not children or whether all this uh, folk psychology is a, a singular thing as a theory of mind or whether or not one can break apart these different components into different uh, component uh, understandings. And in some ways, um, this has already been done where uh, in developmental research, uh, people have looked at other aspects of social cognition. Um, so for example, uh, uh, work has been done that has shown that uh, even young infants understand goal-directed actions. And, uh, and slightly older infants, uh, depending on some people interpret, the goal-directed actions understanding is perhaps intentions, but uh, more explicitly, at least by 18 months, uh, children seem to understand uh, intentions where, uh, for example, in the Meltzoff study, uh, children were asked to imitate a particular action and they recognized that even when the person failed to complete the actual action they were trying to do, so for example, pulling apart a toy but unable to pull off uh, actually sort of uh, failing to pull off the toy when it, the child is asked to imitate it, the child imitates the intended action rather than the actual observed action. Um, children also understand the importance of eye gaze for conveying uh, information about uh, the, the person, such as what they're uh, labeling the uh, particular novel object to be called. Um, we also know that young children understand diverse desires and, um, oh, there's nobody there. It's uh, meant to be Harris. Um, or that uh, children also in the uh, early years develop a uh, different aspect of understanding emotions and also uh, understanding uh, traits. However, um, most of this work has been talked about as social cognition and have been hypothesized to be uh, contributing aspects to theory of mind. Um, or have been explicitly, uh, for example, by Wellman as actual part of theory of mind, but still overwhelmingly the research has focused on false belief and has, uh, hasn't sort of put these together in a coherent story in terms of what it means uh, to develop a, uh, a adult theory of mind. So um, some of my work is trying to put all of this together and um, the initial work that I did to do this was to look at uh, whether or not children develop an understanding of different mental states uh, as part of a uh, progression theory of mind. So um, from some of this earlier work, there was a suggestion that children understand these different things at different ages. Um, my work doesn't go into the infant years, but even within the preschool years from uh, late twos to through six, you see uh, different aspects of uh, mental state understanding and so one question was um, when you actually sort of put these tasks together and compare them across so uh, when you see different ages for different tasks across different studies it might be because there were different uh, types of, or different populations being tested or different labs were doing it so we're uh, interested in putting it all together to see whether or not children develop uh, in a uh, uh, progression where they understand certain mental states at an earlier age than other mental states. Um, another reason for doing this was also to see whether or not this developmental progression was actually on the individual child level. 
So it might be the case that children, I'm gonna do that. Um, it might be the case that children, uh, on average, develop an understanding of certain mental states before uh, other uh, mental states. But it might not be the case that all children, sort of, say, for example, uh, uh, develop an understanding of desires before beliefs. And so we wanted to test this to see whether or not uh, this developmental progression was uh, consistent. And so we devised a protocol to test a number of different uh, theory of mind tasks. Uh, we initially started with, I think, nine tasks, but in the end, um, we trimmed it down to five tasks because there were a lot of tasks that had overlapping ages. Um, so for today, we'll just be talking about five of the tasks. And what we did was we tried to design um, the tasks in a parallel structure to minimize uh, the cognitive demand between the tasks. So we didn't want children to be performing uh, poorly compared to another task on certain tasks simply because the task involved more memory or more problem solving demands. And we did this with uh, three to through five year olds. And uh, I just want to go through two uh, of the tasks, uh, going through all five would take too long, but um, we did a uh, diverse desires task where we had presented a child with uh, a picture of a carrot or a cookie. And uh, here we have, uh, we actually, in our actual task, we had a puppet, but um, we might present a child a story about Timmy and telling the child that uh, Timmy wants a snack and Timmy can either choose a carrot or a cookie. And then after setting that up, we asked the child what is um, the child subject, what in fact he or she wants. And not surprisingly, uh, most children chose the cookie. Uh, we actually had about 25% of the children choose the carrot, which suggests um, some healthy eating among the uh, two to five year olds. So some hope for the future. Um, and, but we'll assume uh, you guys are as the subjects chose the cookie, and at which point we then tell the child that's a good choice, but Timmy here, he doesn't like cookies. What he really wants are uh, carrots. And then we ask the child, uh, now Timmy can choose a snack, and he can only choose one, which one will he choose? And so the question is uh, whether the child can uh, in a sense, overcome their own, or recognize that their own desires is different than uh, Timmy's, and so predict that Timmy will choose the carrot. Um, we set up a similar or parallel uh, diverse belief task. So the next case in the belief or desires task, we're simply uh, asking children to recognize that people can have diversity of uh, desires. In the diverse belief task, we set up a similar type of uh, uh, story where uh, we have Timmy again and Timmy's looking for his cat. The cat might be hiding uh, under the bushes or might be hiding in the garage. And we ask the child, uh, where do you think the cat is hiding? And children chose randomly between the two. Uh, we'll assume the child said the garage. And after hearing that from the child, we told the child, just as we did with the diverse uh, desires task, that's a good choice, but Timmy, he doesn't think the cat's in the garage, he thinks the cat's hiding under the bushes. And then we ask uh, the child to predict, now Timmy's gonna look for his cat and he can only look for it in one place, where will he look for his cat? Um, and so uh, the question here is whether children understand diversity of belief where, because they have a particular belief about where the cat might be hiding, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that Timmy shares it. And, um, Interestingly, even though the two tasks are very parallel and they're simply about diversity of mental states, um, we found uh, it might not look sort of as consistent or as swapping, but there was a significant difference uh, between the tasks where children uh, clearly uh, understood diverse desires better than they understood uh, diverse beliefs. And, um, and in this task, it was uh, the distance between the two performances wasn't uh, super big, but we also did a meta-analysis uh, where we compare uh, a whole bunch of other people's study which, uh, where we could classify tasks that were talking about diverse desires or diverse beliefs. 
there a question? Uh, yeah, in the previous two uh, studies, when yeah. the kid said car uh, carrot or uh -huh. the kid said bush, did you then tell them that good choice, but Timmy would actually prefer a cookie or? Right, cookie? so whatever so they said, opposite. we told them the, the character likes the opposite. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, when we did a meta-analysis, it was found that um, across a number of uh, <laughs> studies, it, it seemed at least uh, with the studies available, there was about a eight to 10 month uh, lag where children uh, develop an understanding of desires to, and uh, only uh, about eight to 10 months later, they develop an understanding of the first beliefs. And this is, um, to me at least, a very interesting finding because uh, if you think about it, if indeed for both of them, they're simply about diversity of mental states, it's not that difficult once you hear what you like and then hear what someone else likes, simply go with first what someone else sort of has in terms of their mental state, uh, simply go with that in answering the question. But yet uh, there are uh, children who can understand that for a diversity of desires, but yet can't comprehend why someone else would have a different uh, thought than they, they would. Um, another interesting aspect of this is that uh, the diverse desires actually you would think involves more inhibitory uh, needs. So in fact, um, when we ask them about what they like for a snack, um, and then they have to overcome it in order to answer the correct answer, um, whereas for the choosing where they think the bush or the cats in the bush or the garage, they just sort of simply made that guess, so they don't have as much adherence to it. Um, and so you would think the inhibitory problem would be greater for diverse desires, but yet um, they're actually doing better at that one than diverse uh, beliefs. Uh, So we also then um, tested, or here I'm presenting uh, three other mental states that we tested the children on. Uh, one is on knowledge ignorance, which is uh, simply that uh, understanding that someone wouldn't have knowledge about a particular object if they've never seen the object or seen inside of, uh, where the object is in. Uh, a false belief, which we had already talked about, and uh, a false emotions task, which is um, uh, parallel to the false belief, but instead of there being a contrast between a person's mental state and reality, here there's a contrast between a person's sort of internal emotion, understanding that someone's internal emotions might be different than the actual overt display that they can have. So simply understanding that someone can feel sad but look happy on the outside. Um, and what we find um, extends from the diverse of uh, desires and diverse belief data I presented, which is uh, across the task, they become increasingly more difficult. And within each task, you see a developmental trend where uh, the three, four, and five-year-olds become increasingly better at the task. And so, um, so we found this, where we compared it across, uh, on average, where children seem to show this developmental progression where uh, they have different uh, ages in which they come to understand each of these different concepts. And uh, we also did uh, uh, Roche analysis and government analysis, which uh, I won't go too much into, but in a sense, the vast majority of the children also show the same exact pattern. So I uh, remember before I was talking about we were also interested in whether or not, not simply that this was uh, a progression on average, but whether, rather that each individual child actually develops diverse desires versus diverse belief versus uh, knowledge ignorance uh, before they develop false belief. And so what we found was indeed, if the child ever failed any of these tasks, they failed all of the harder tasks, and if they passed any of the tasks, they passed all of the um, easier tasks. Um, and we found uh, about 80% of the children uh, fit that pattern. Um, 20% of the children didn't, but also recognized that for each of these tasks, they were given a fourth choice between two items, and so if a child sort of simply couldn't understand it, they could still sometimes randomly guess correctly on it. Okay, so um, our uh, conclusion from this was that uh, even within the preschool years, there are multiple developments uh, in children's theory of mind, and um, this uh, progression has been uh, replicated across a number of different labs. Another usefulness of uh, this is that uh, people have been using it as a sort of, uh, 
a scalar measure for individual differences types of research, uh, rather than sort of simply being sticking with just the false belief task, they're able to use a much uh, wider range. And so this has been tested across a number of different labs. Um, and the uh, same progression has been found across uh, in labs in North America, Europe, and uh, Australia. And um, as you might notice, there are sort of parts of the world missing uh, from that uh, story, which we'll uh, come back to later. <coughs> So, um, so one uh, interest that people have long held with, uh, about theory of mind is whether or not the developments that are observed, uh, mostly in North American and European labs, are also observed in uh, non-European or North American uh, societies. And uh, the false belief task, because it is such a widely used task have been tested all across the world. And in uh, Wellman et al.'s 2001 meta-analysis, they uh, did a compare, or they included these different countries and um, concluded that there was uh, a consistent developmental progression or the trajectory was the same. You might not have the same exact uh, uh, sort of timing in terms of when children exactly sort of pass uh, the threshold of passing the false belief pass, but you get the same consistent uh, uh, where failing <coughs> to consistent uh, passing. Uh, but uh, even though they plotted some uh, data from Africa or South America, uh, those data points were only really represented by one or two studies. And so uh, even in that meta-analysis, they were over, uh, overwhelmingly represented by uh, labs in North America and in Western Europe. Um, but since that meta-analysis, um, a number of studies have been conducted, and indeed the largest sample of non-North uh, American or European um, uh, populations that have been tested on the false belief task has been uh, with Chinese children. And so uh, we conducted a meta-analysis of this where we compared uh, 196 Chinese conditions a condition meaning a, a particular uh, a group within a particular study. Um, and uh, it was divided or made up of 127 from mainland China and 69 uh, from Hong Kong. And it represented more than uh, 3,000 children. And we compared it against uh, 155 uh, similar North American conditions, uh, similar in that they had uh, similar uh, types of presentation. So if uh, one study presented the uh, stimuli with puppets. We had a compare, comparable uh, condition where they where the North American uh, conditions also presented with puppets. Uh, and what we found was uh, a consistent trajectory, and actually, um, to my surprise, was a overwhelmingly consistent or parallel trajectory where uh, this is taking the uh, logit where uh, we took the proportion uh, passing at each age and uh, plotted it. And when you uh, transform it into logit, you're able to plot it in uh, a straight line. And what we were, uh, what I was surprised by was how uh, parallel these lines were. There wasn't any uh, significant interaction at all between the lines. So. Um, so across all the different uh, countries or uh, <coughs> nations tested or compared, the uh, trajectory was this consistent from uh, consistently getting it wrong to consistently getting it uh, correct. Uh, what we, we did find was that the Hong Kong group, for some whatever reason, uh, did lag behind in terms of the actual timing. Uh, where, whereas for the Canadian, uh, mainland China, and United States uh, conditions, there wasn't any significant uh, difference. Um, in our paper, we try to come up with some um, hand waving for why uh, Hong Kong might be delayed, but really the truth is uh, we have uh, no real good reason. Um, a number of things actually sort of that pops up actually works against it. So, for example, uh, studies have found that if you have a sibling in your family, you perform better at theory of mind. 
And so with that condition, you might think that the mainland China, which has the one child policy, would actually perform worse than the Hong Kong population. And indeed, we don't see that. Or uh, you might think that the uh, Hong Kong population might be slightly more westernized than the mainland population. Um, but yet, they're the ones who, who are outliers. So, um, so there appears to be cultural differences or uh, linguistic differences that could affect the actual uh, timing of the development, but uh, it remains uh, to be seen what exactly those factors uh, might be. But um, a problem with comparing uh, cross-cultural uh, cross research, as probably many of you guys know, is even when you're doing a meta-analysis, there's no guarantee that the population tested in, the, say, the United States, or in mainland China, or in Hong Kong, were actually uh, comparable populations. So we know um, there are just simply testing differences between low-income and high-income uh, children. And so uh, it's hard to know exactly whether or not we have comparable uh, populations when we're simply doing an absolute comparison and performance across different uh, countries. Which is why looking at beyond the false belief task is a good idea. Uh, so we uh, did a scaling study in China of the five tasks that I have presented previously. And here we tested 140 uh, preschool age children living in Beijing on the theory mind scale. And uh, what we wanted to do was compare their <coughs> performance against, um, at that time, the uh, American or the English speaking data that we had, which was in the US and Australia, uh, which were, uh, had shown similar uh, progressions. And what we found was that. Uh, here was the progression again from uh, our initial study, which was diverse desires was easier than diverse belief, which then was easier than knowledge and false belief and false emotions. Um, instead of finding the same exact progression, uh, which had been found across uh, many North American, Australian, and European labs, um, we found with the children in China where uh, diverse desires was again, the earliest, and, but instead of uh, being followed by diverse belief, we had a flip between uh, knowledge and diverse belief. So um, at least with this population, it seemed that uh, the children understood that somebody had to have access to information in order to have knowledge before they recognized that people can have a diversity or differences in their beliefs. Um, and uh, again, the false belief and false emotion uh, follow as being the later development. So what you can see here is there are both uh, differences as well as similarities between the two different uh, populations where um, overall uh, there wasn't sort of some bizarre uh, difference where diverse desires was the uh, most difficult um, or that the false emotion was the most difficult or the easiest, but uh, at least with neighboring tasks, which were um, when we actually compare, uh, initially the two tasks, diverse belief and knowledge, were uh, much closer to each other than, say, knowledge to false belief. Uh, and where in the children from China was able to show that they actually had a reverse in that uh, understanding. And again, um, this just demonstrates um, that by simply looking at more than uh, the false belief task, you're able to find some uh, similarities in development as well as differences in development without having to necessarily worry as much about having comparable uh, populations. But um, what we're uh, currently following up on is uh, trying to determine in uh, uh, very different uh, variables to determine what exactly about the Chinese children uh, leads them to understand uh, knowledge before uh, diverse belief. So, um, so although the Chinese children appear comparable uh, on simply looking at the false belief uh, performance, there uh, are potential differences as well as similarities in their progression of understanding different uh, mental states. And um, 
I have been uh, told, although uh, this, this, these data have not been uh, published yet, but it seems from uh, colleagues who have taken our task and used it in uh, Japan and Korea, they seem to also have found the same type of uh, flip between knowledge and diverse belief that we had found. So um, it seems, at least uh, initially, that uh, this particular progression has been uh, uh, well replicated in uh, Western uh, or North American uh, cultures, whereas uh, this particular uh, progression seemed to uh, have uh, some replication within uh, East Asian uh, cultures. And so it remains to be seen why, why exactly there is that flip, but um, at least these other labs gives us um, sort of some confidence that our, the finding, our, our findings are robust in uh, there being some cultural differences there. Um, another comparison you might look at is with children with autism. And uh, a number of studies have found that children perform poorly on the false belief task. And uh, even when you take uh, very high functioning autistic children who have uh, verbal mental ages uh, around five or six years of age, which is when typically developing children pass the false belief task, you find that they are still overwhelmingly um, uh, failing. However, uh, if you do go old enough in terms of verbal mental age, which is um, rare among autistic children seems, since the vast majority of them have uh, severe mental retardation. But um, if you are able to find uh, high-functioning uh, autistic children who uh, have verbal mental ages well above six years of age, they do eventually pass the false belief task. Uh, but one question people have uh, wondered about is even uh, these uh, individuals who it, uh, ultimately do pass the false belief task, whether or not they're really understanding false belief in the same way that uh, typically developing children would. And another um, interesting point in comparing the autistic children is with uh, deaf children. So um, something that I didn't realize before I started doing this research is, which to me or also for, is actually an obvious point, most deaf children are born to hearing parents and so there actually are uh, late signers. So imagine you're born to hearing parents and you can't hear uh, the sounds that they're producing and so you actually don't start learning language from sign language uh, until you're, say, for example, put into a, a program in school. And so what often happens in these cases are children are uh, uh, develop language at a much later age and so they become much delayed in a number of cognitive uh, task. And uh, lo and behold, the deaf late signers are also uh, uh, similarly delayed as the children matched on verbal mental age with autism, where they uh, perform equally poorly on the false belief task. Um, but it's not thought that this is due to actually something uh, core to their cognitive uh, neural processes, but rather simply due to a uh, delay in the type of linguistic or other social inputs that they're receiving. So um, an important comparison group is that the deaf native signers, which are uh, a much smaller population, but they're uh, deaf children who are born to, say, deaf parents who are already signing. And so they learn language at the same time as typically developing children would. And they don't show any uh, language delays. And similarly, they don't show any uh, delays in the uh, false belief task. So, um, so people have taken this data about the deaf late signers uh, having similar uh, comparable delays or absolute differences or delays in terms of the age at which they're passing the false belief task compared to high functioning children with autism. And so um, this has led to a potential alternative explanation for why children with autism have uh, difficulty with theory of mind. So uh, the initial hypothesis was that they have a core deficit in their actual uh, social brain. But the alternative hypothesis might be that you have, just as with the deaf children who are born to, or who are late signers, the uh, children with autism somehow uh, have poor linguistic or other social inputs. Um, 
clearly it's not the same type of uh, limitations, but it might be some other form of deficits that have limited it, their inputs. And so perhaps this is the reason why children with autism uh, are also delayed or uh, show impairments in theory of mind. So um, we wanted to test this with the scaling study because um, all the previous studies have simply compared them on absolute performance on the false lead test. And we were curious whether or not, um, indeed, the children with autism and the children uh, who are late signers actually develop in a similar developmental progression, that is, um, the children who ultimately pass the false, the autistic children who ultimately pass the false belief test, are they really developing understanding of false belief like uh, typically developing children? Yeah. Uh, could you just clarify what you meant by, uh, by poor systems? What you to um, simply put, it's just um, something that's actually in the uh, sort of cognitive system where the um, the actual cortical processes. From so, right. So rather, or it's not that specific. It's simply just it's not due to say some other aspect of input that's uh, leading it to it not develop, but rather it's the actual sort of whatever social cognitive computations there are that's actually itself delayed or impair rather than it not developing because it wasn't receiving the right input. So it's not a very specific um, definition. Um, and so we tested uh, 36 uh, late signers as, and a important comparison group of uh, native signers as well as children uh, with autism. Um, we actually interest, or luckily got uh, this population from uh, an Australian program uh, with Candy Peterson where these uh, late signers and native signers and children with autism were all in, they weren't in the same classroom necessarily, but they were in the same program. And so um, in some other ways, they were also uh, a comparison group or a comparable in, ter in terms of other factors with each other. And we uh, matched them, or not necessarily matched them, but took a range of children from uh, three to 13 uh, years in terms of verbal mental age. The vast majority of the children were uh, of verbal mental age from three to six, but to increase the uh, sample size and also knowing that children with autism do perform poorly on these tasks, we sort of increased it up to 13 years to get a larger sample of the children with autism. So um, this is their verbal mental age as measured by some standardized uh, linguistics uh, measure their actual age was actually from 5 to 18 years of age. And um, what we found actually surprisingly um, for me was that uh, the typically developing children again here is their progression. The uh, deaf children late signer um, again remember their false belief task performance are at a much later age but what we found was that they simply had a more <coughs> down developmental uh, time frame, but they still follow the same exact uh, developmental progression. But uh, for the children with autism, who actually initially our hypothesis was that um, their development of social cognition would be so chaotic that there actually would not be any consistency uh, with them where we thought perhaps they might sort of come along and learn how to solve each of these different tasks. At random, uh, in random ways, but what we actually uh, found was that they still show a strong consistency that was similar to the other population in the early task where uh, they understood diverse desires versus uh, earlier than diverse beliefs versus uh, earlier than knowledge. Uh, the only difference we found was in the last, the two last most difficult tasks. Yeah. I'm assuming most of the children with autism did not pass false belief and false emotion altogether. Um, most of them didn't, but a large percentage of them did in order for us to be able to compare. Any idea? Any portions? So, I mean, so the end is very small for the last. Yeah. So. Um, about 20% uh, of the children passed the false emotions task, and um, probably 12, 13% passed the false belief task. Um, but we did find against this individual level consistency where if a uh, child with autism 
pass a particular task, they pass all the easier tasks and fail all the harder tasks. So um, instead of having a, uh, a chaotic aspect of uh, learning uh, about social concepts, they actually do show their own particular progression. Now, um, this is only with this particular group of uh, children with autism. I wouldn't want to make the, a larger claim about necessarily all children with autism in that uh, at least these children were in, were in sort of comparable school programs as the other children. Um, but what we do find is that they, for some reason, uh, find the false belief task to be much, much harder uh, than the uh, false emotions task. And so um, what we see is even though the, uh, the deaf late signers and the children with autism are similarly delayed in their um, passing of any of these uh, task in an absolute term relative to the other tasks, there seemed to be a different progression. So um, at least for us, it seems to be a strike against um, the uh, hypothesis that um, all of the theory of mind difficulties in autism is due to uh, poor linguistic or other social uh, inputs, and that there is perhaps something specific about the way they understand social concepts that is different than uh, typically developing uh, children. So, um, so up to now I've been presenting um, the scaling data, which has in a sense argued that we can uh, do more fine-grained uh, comparisons across groups when we looked at uh, uh, progression of developments rather than simply looking at uh, one task. Um, but uh, the question that probably people have been wondering about is why exactly do children understand some mental states um, before others? And surprisingly this um, question has not been really, uh, uh, the theoretical work has not really been done on this so um, I list some possible uh, hypothesis about this, but it's actually possible to have other hypotheses as well. Um, so one possibility is that there's simply a single computational system for, under, for processing mental states, and that it simply becomes more proficient. So uh, for whatever reason, uh, false belief is more difficult of a mental state to process than, say, diverse desires. And um, it's similarly processed, but it becomes when it becomes more proficient, it's able to process these harder mental states. Um, another possibility is that there are simply uh, completely separate computational systems for each of these different components. And so you might have uh, a specific set of uh, computational systems for processing diverse desires that is completely different than what is needed to uh, process uh, diverse beliefs. Or, it might be some uh, uh, recruitment of different sort of computational uh, processes or comp comp uh, component abilities that uh, is needed to solve each of these different mental states and that each of these components perhaps develop in a different time frame. And so uh, the uh, putting them uh, together takes different uh, uh, timetables. Uh, so, one way in which we have uh, gone about to try to <coughs> begin answering this question is to uh, specifically compare, or one of the main comparisons that I'm interested in is this diverse desires versus diverse uh, beliefs. Um, because the nice thing about it is, uh, as I have mentioned, the ability to um, present them in a very parallel structure where Simply put, the children have to understand that um, people can have different uh, desires or different beliefs that uh, might be different from their own, or that two different people can have uh, two different desires or two different um, beliefs. And uh, we went about uh, one of the ways in which to address this question is to do an ERP study that compared desire reasoning versus uh, belief reasoning. And uh, because of the nice parallelness of a, uh, we were able to contrast uh, diverse desires versus diverse belief conditions uh, in a similar way, but we also included a uh, physical control. So um, 
I'll talk a little bit more about the physical control uh, when I present uh, each of the stimuli, but before I move ahead, I just want to make sure uh, people know what ERPs are. And um, a simplified way of talking about ERPs is that it's simply an average of a bunch of EEG data in order to find the underlying uh, neuroactivity that's associated with a specific cognitive <coughs> event. Um, the uh, thought is that EG, ongoing EEG data is uh, composed of a number of different uh, tasks where part of it is simply to maintain the brain uh, as being active, but whenever you're uh, uh, involved with solving a particular cognitive task, your brain uh, activates its or uh, elicits brain waves in a way that is specifically associated with that task. Unfortunately, that specific uh, neuroactivity is, uh, the, the size of that activity is much, much smaller than the ongoing EEG data. And to get around that, one simply uh, collects a uh, number of trials of the EEG data, which are thought to be uh, randomly occurring relative to a specific kind of event, in which case you can say, uh, take an external event in order to make sure that this particular kind of uh, activity occurs uh, time lock to something you can use, and so when you uh, time lock the EEG data and average out uh, a number of trials, the hope is that because the EEG data, ongoing EEG data is random, that they would average each other out uh, to be zero, and then so voila, what you have left over is the uh, neuroactivity that's specifically associated with that particular cognitive event. Um, and before I also go into the task, I want to mention that uh, that uh, there have been a number of uh, studies or neuroimaging studies on theory of mind in adults, and uh, what has uh, converged out of this uh, these research is that um, roughly put, there has been a debate between two camps, where uh, one camp has been uh, arguing that the theory of mind region is the medial and medial prefrontal cortex, whereas uh, another camp has been arguing that the critical theory of mind region is in the right temporal parietal uh, junction. And um, as you might have guessed, uh, given the tenure of this talk, um, I find this to be the wrong debate because um, there's not simply a, a single theory of mind region, but rather um, what, they, what is important to look at are the computational uh, component processes. So, um, so one, the, uh, another motivation for this research was to uh, try to uh, look at more uh, specific mental states being processed to see whether or not that could speak to this uh, debate between the medial prefrontal and the temporal parietal junction uh, camp. And uh, the, what we did was we presented children, or the first study was with adults. We presented uh, adults with a box and told that uh, in the box was a snack and uh, we uh, presented these uh, on the computer monitor to the child, telling them that the boy likes the carrot but the girl likes the cherry. And then um, we flash and uh, what's actually in the box. So for example, we might flash the carrot or the cherry. The reason we're doing this in a convoluted way is because of, for ERP, we need to time lock it to a specific event. And so um, we time lock it to the presentation of either the carrot or the cherry, uh, before which we ask who says, um, I want some when they see this, and then we flash either the carrot or the cherry or we, we ask who says, um, I don't want any when they see this, and then we flash the carrot or the cherry. So the idea is to ask them to reason about a desire uh, problem, and then, uh, but also not being able to, in a sense, start reasoning about it until they see the object being flashed. Uh, we uh, also had a parallel uh, condition for diverse belief where uh, we told the child, or the adults, that there was a mystery box and that the boy guessed that the mystery box has a carrot 
but the girl guessed that the mystery box has a uh, has cherries. And um, again, we ask the question and then flash the object for the uh, subject. So in this case, we ask who said I was right when they see this, and we flash either the carrot or the cherry. Or we ask who said I was wrong when they see this, and we flash either the carrot or the cherry. Um, as you might have noticed, because of this nice uh, aspect of diverse desires versus diverse belief tasks being so parallel in structure, that if you're asked to do this uh, multiple times, you might slowly just understand that all you have to do is simply associate this with this and this with this, and then answer according to either it being a positive connection or a negative connection. So you can simply use a low level uh, problem solving strategy that which doesn't involve mental states at all, uh, which simply involves association. And so we wanted to uh, include a, a condition to make sure or to counter against that in case that that indeed was what the uh, subjects were doing. So again, we were worried that uh, subjects could simply solve both of these conditions without even alluding to uh, mental states at all. And so we had a physical control, which was simply um, in a sense, uh, a manifestation of this association problem solving uh, strategy where we asked, uh, we told the subject that the carrots go into the red bin and the cherries go into the yellow bin. And then we asked the subject, uh, where does this go? And then we flash either the carrot or the cherry, or uh, where does this, uh, where don't you put this? And then we had flash either the carrot or the cherry. Um, and so we were actually initially worried that um, presenting so many of these trials to adult subjects, they would um, sort of figure out that they could simply do this physical control condition for all of them. Um, so we were actually uh, surprised then that we were actually able to find uh, differences uh, between them. And indeed, actually across a number of different tasks, I have found that even when uh, subjects, adult subjects are asked to uh, solve uh, mental state questions where they could solve it in a non-mental state form, they seem to actually still allude to mental state form. So there um, seems to be something very uh, salient about thinking about mental states where they uh, allude to it even when they don't have to. Um, so uh, what we found was a, um, this is plotting uh, a three by three grid of uh, the different channels on the scalp and what you have here are uh, frontal, uh, central, and posterior channels and uh, left, mid, and uh, right uh, channels. And what we found was a uh, ERP component differentiating the uh, two mental state conditions from the physical condition in the medial uh, frontal uh, channel and uh, we found a right posterior channel that differentiated the belief condition from both the desire and the physical uh, condition. And so uh, our, our uh, interpretation of this is that uh, for desire reasoning there seems to be uh, a simply a computation of diversity or contrast between either um, uh, between a mental state and reality, or between two people's uh, mental state that is served by um, some uh, computational processes in the pre medial prefrontal cortex. Um, and so uh, simply doing that diversity appears to be uh, uh, all that was needed to solve the desires task, whereas for the beliefs task, there needed to be both that understanding of that um, contrast as well as potentially, as um, Rebecca Sachs has argued, a uh, right posterior uh, system which is primarily associated with processing of representations. So again, um, I, I don't want to say that this is all that there is to desire reasoning or belief reasoning. Um, the problem with any imaging study is you're only able to get the uh, neural data that is um, available, but that doesn't need, mean that there are other uh, neural activity that isn't there that simply isn't be able, able to be picked up by your methods. But um, what this suggests is a uh, potential development where uh, children are understanding desires 
uh, before belief because they're able to uh, simply solve it by doing contrast, um, whereas to understand beliefs, even though here we're simply dealing with diversity of beliefs and they didn't necessarily have to deal with um, contrasting a false belief versus a reality, they nevertheless seem to elicit potentially a representational aspect of that problem solving. Um, so um, we then, we, as was obvious since our stimuli is cartoons, we were doing this because we wanted to then move on to children. And uh, here's the requisite uh, anytime you do ERP studies with children, ERP uh, picture of a child with some dangly things off of their head. Um, so we just collected this data, and in fact, um, I just got some new data um, in the past few days. So this is um, the fresh data that isn't uh, completely um, analyzed yet, but I just wanted to at least preview some uh, finding that seemed to have come out of our initial study. So uh, remember uh, with the adult finding, we found a medial prefrontal component that was associated with reasoning about uh, both desires and uh, beliefs, and a right posterior uh, ERP component that was associated perhaps, or only with the beliefs condition, so perhaps something about uh, representations. And so um, we uh, tested seven-year-olds first because we um, it's difficult to do with preschool children, so we were doing it with the older children first and then slowly moving down. Um, but surprisingly, because of the speed and nature of the task, even within the seven-year-olds, they uh, were performing or answering correctly to the physical condition uh, at a much more significant uh, level than the uh, diverse belief condition, and they were actually performing on that even uh, better than the diverse, or no, the diverse desires condition, and uh, finally the diverse belief condition they were actually performing the worst on. Um, but this is with seven-year-olds, so the uh, percentage of performances was um, 75 percent, 85 percent, and 95 percent. So um, they weren't none of these were they well below uh, 50 percent. Um, but what we uh, have found was, and these are four channels um, sent to me by a graduate student uh, in the prefrontal cortex. So uh, what we found was um, a uh, what we had found before. Um, except this time we actually found a, a polarity difference, but again we found a uh, differentiation between the two mental state condition from the physical condition in the prefrontal cortex, uh, in the prefrontal channel, but we weren't able to find a similar uh, differentiation in the right posterior. So um, it seems, at least uh, initially uh, from that data, that children um, seem to develop this diversity aspect of the, or the prefrontal aspect of this, uh, comp these different computational uh, processes uh, first before developing perhaps the more representational uh, aspects. So um, in conclusion, um, I hope I was able to uh, at least somewhat convince you that theory of mind um, is not simply the false belief task, and indeed, uh, especially when comparing across different populations, looking at a progression of uh, understandings uh, can uh, give you more fine-tuned um, understandings about uh, potential similarities and uh, differences, and, um, and hopefully with that understanding, um, one would uh, sort of simply want to ask about theory of mind as being uh, yes or no. And I think this is, um, in fact, um, something that uh, uh, sort of dovetails well with uh, what the uh, Tomasello group is now thinking about chimpanzees and other uh, non human primates' understanding of uh, mental states. So, um, Joseph Call and uh, Mike Joseph Tomasello's current take on chimpanzees and understanding of uh, mental states is that they understand some aspect of seeing, so they can, uh, they're sophisticated at keeping track of uh, what other conspecifics see or don't see and making use of that information. 
but they don't seem to, or at least in their interpretation, have an understanding of uh, beliefs. So um, it seems uh, across a number of studies that there is something about seeing that is uh, powerful, but um, is only a sort of part of what or other animals are able to process. And indeed, um, Mike Tomasello now argues that um, the question then for chimpanzees isn't so much uh, whether or not they have a uh, theory in mind, but what as but he, uh, in a sense, agrees with what I've been arguing, that it's about what aspect and to what extent uh, they, that they have these different uh, capacities. And um, certainly for these other uh, populations, we can now uh, perhaps approach them in, um, in a way that's not simply about whether or not yes or no, so for example, um, some recent debates about whether infants have a uh, theory of mind, um, perhaps what they have are some component processes of it, but not necessarily all of the uh, different uh, components. And so um, I want to conclude there and thank some previous uh, readers as well as uh, graduate students who have been uh, much more involved with the data collection uh, in actually doing the hard work of uh, measuring ERPs from children, and, and I sort of have given that up. Uh, okay, um, and I'm happy to take questions.